Hey everyone, Draco Magnus here for another episode of Let's Play Omen Excitio Play. In the last episode, we met back up with our good friend Reginald, who's decided to help us out in doing research on this disease that is afflicting the people of Africa. And we learned from our research, one, that the symbol that we saw over in Zanzibar was an Egyptian symbol, two, that there is a particular doctor who is researching a very uh, similar disease, if not the exact same disease, in Holland. And three, we decided to go to Holland with our good friend Reginald. But without further ado, let's talk to Reginald and see what he thinks about these various topics we have. Germans. I must tell you that I accepted some money from a group of Germans, and I think I may have made a mistake. It's a lot of money. I can't see what your mistake could have been. You cannot help but laugh at your friend's reaction. Although you've already recounted what transpired in Zanzibar, you now tell him all about Meyer and the strangeness of the circumstances in which he sought you out. First in Africa, then immediately upon your return to England. Well, I don't think you have any sort of legal obligation to him aside from the money. And besides, if you're fulfilling your side of the bargain by continuing your research, if it turns out to be as, as new and dangerous as you think, you can always mis make it public, and there won't be much left for Meyer anyway. Reginald's reasoning is actually fairly sound, but nevertheless, you cannot share his optimism entirely. You doubt that this agreement will come to such an easy resolution. Reggie, why are you willing to come with me? You really need to know, I have two very good reasons to be here. Your friend smiles warmly and grabs his stomach. This here wants to try some new food. I haven't had a proper adventure since I was a student at the university, and I don't know how much longer I'll be able to have them. Reginald laughs heartily. You look at him waiting to hear his second reason. Secondly, Jake, you don't seem to me to be any sort in any sort of condition to deal with all this alone. I'm afraid you just end up doing something daft. And lastly, the disease. I'm glad that Jake has a friend like Reginald. Reginald's a very good guy. It seems to me from the symptoms that you've described to be a strain of the plague, but with many, perhaps too many, incongruous details. It may well turn out to be a new type of bacterium, or perhaps something else. New theories are always emerging in our area of study. Do not in agreement. That is why it's so important to speak with B-Man because I refuse to try and pronounce that name. And now we rest. Before getting some rest, let's eat some of this food brought by that uniformed girl just now. Reginald uncovers a big silver platter and releases a cloud of wonderful smelling steam. For once, you decide to join your gourmet companion in his re repast before sitting down into your comfortable bunk. Once more for the whole trip, sleep refuses to treat you kindly. You can't stop thinking about Zanzibar, of Meyer, and of the disease. Every train of thought breeds new mysteries. You only hope that B-Man can give you some answers to these questions which are driving you mad. Opening your eyes, the first thing you see is Reginald. He's reading a book and chewing something. He smiles when he sees that you're awake. He was about to speak when there is a loud ringing. The ship is entering Rotterdam port. Oh, right. Continue. The coach driver shouts something to you in, har in a hard German accent, and you are out of the carriage. Look, fumble. And you look out of the carriage window. You finally, you are finally leaving Rotterdam behind. And after a while, you make it out, make out the first signs of the outskirts of Delft. With the money given to you by the Germans, you have no trouble finding great lodgings near the university. It is a fine building, and Reginald is already at the window scoping the best spots to eat. There are indeed various places on both sides of the canal. Since you're feeling excited, as if at the start of some pleasurable holiday, you decide to relax and enjoy the moment, rather than dwell on the reality of being caught up in a complex web of intrigue and mysteries. And you know what, Jack? You fucking deserve it, man. You've had to go through a lot of shit and not a lot of time. You unpack and organize the few things you brought with you, 
and while Reginald takes care of the formalities related to your accommodations, you decide to go straight to the university and try to see B-Man. As you leave, uh, as you leave, you close the door behind you. It does not seem very solid. Having studied a map of Delft, you know that it's pretty straightforward to get to the university from where you were staying. You walk a few streets and soon you find yourself at the steps that lead up to the college. Ask university administration where Dr. B-Man is, or ask university administrator to announce your arrival to Dr. B-Man. Well, he's not expecting me, so how about we do that? He shows you to the office of Dr. Martinus B-Man. You are in such a state of agitation, you feel almost as if you are, te you are a teenager about to go on a first date. You knock and enter the office. Professor B-Man recognizes you and immediately welcomes you warmly. Soon as I heard your English accent, I knew who you were. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can do Dutch. I apologize to anyone Dutch in the audience right now. The professor offers to give you a tour of the college, and you take an opportunity to see the laboratory where you will be working together and exchanging ideas over the following days. B-Man is friendly, but he's currently avoiding talking about the reason why you are here. Professor B-Man's quintess... We... Questions? Questions. Questions. We'll go with questions. Continues to exasperate you over the days that follow. Every morning, you make your way to the lab, to the laboratory, where you spend a few hours with him, or alone when he has lectures. You study various diseases and discuss theories together, without ever explicitly discussing that disease. Every time you bring it up, B-Man immediately changes the subject, but since it's clear that much of the research that you are doing has many things in common with African, the African disease, you decide not to force the issue for now. Your time in Delft is fast beginning to follow a routine. Reginald often comes with you to the laboratory, but most of the time he wanders around the city enjoying its culinary traditions, about which he gives you an enthusiastic nightly report. Or reports, excuse me. Sometimes you go out with him to eat, but you often have a strange and unpleasant feeling that you're being watched. You're trying a traditional stamp pot, which Reginald has been ranting about for days. B-Man is busy at the university, and Reginald is away for a few days visiting the... The Hague? The Hog? The Hague. We'll go with the Hague. Which is not far away. Once again, you are feeling observed. Damn, someone's witnessing the shit out of me. Or, you know, Jake is just feeling all of us. Me playing the game and all of you watching this video. You know. Or maybe there's some supernatural force that's also watching him. So, you know, any of those options, whichever tickles your fancy, I suppose. But when you look behind you, there's nothing, or perhaps only a shadow. When you notice someone sitting a few tables away, just very stylish, he is brazenly staring straight at you. Meyer! Now, sure, let's chat with Meyer. Meyer, why are you following me? Look, I know you're keeping track of your investment, but what the fuck, man? You move over to where Meyer is sitting. I needed to take a quick sip. Dr. Huntington, what a pleasure! Will you join me for supper? Unseated, a few moments pass in silence. He is measured and calm. He seems to be toying with you. Dr. Huntington, are you satisfied with your decision to collaborate with B-Man and the steady progress being made? Certain details, however, interest us in particular. He's looking at you straight in the eye. His smiling coolness betrays disquieting undertones, and every word seems to contain a veiled threat. We have eyes and ears everywhere, Dr. Huntington. But it is not enough. We require a return on our investment. No final results as yet, rather an update on the current state of your research. You feel repugnant at his menacing tone. However, having accepted their money, you can hardly back out now. A path pathogenic agent smaller than a bacterium. The idea is disturbing, but the research that you and B-Man have been conducting on sick tobacco leaves continues to confirm this seemingly absurd hypothesis. B-Man has already chosen a name for it. Virus. 
it seems almost more like a machine in the way it reproduces, attacking cells and using them to multiply, than a biological organism. Many of the anomalous aspects that have troubled you since Zanzibar are beginning to make some sort of sense. You know, when you think about it, viruses are fucking wild, aren't they? Like, assume for a moment we don't know what viruses are. All we know is that illnesses come from living things, hurting individuals that they are hosting. Like bacterium. Or parasites. These cause illness. But suddenly you've discovered a new thing. A thing that isn't technically considered alive because it doesn't have all the traits of being alive. It's some sort of microscopic automaton that really you have no way of knowing how it was created in the first place, who created it, why they created it, but it is a vehicle for illness, infecting the cells in your body and making more infected cells by birthing them, and more virus, spe uh, virus cells as well. It's a fucking wild concept, isn't it? Almost Lovecraftian. Almost. Your research has come to a critical phase, and B-Man is invigorated, and beginning to show some emotion for the first time. I think the time has finally come for our discoveries to be made public, Dr. Huntington. The world of medicine will never be the same! B-Man has started the process of publication, but it will take time before it is verified and peer-reviewed. We decide to use this time for a short break. You've been recently taking long, reflective walks around Delft, trying to tally the results from your research with pathology of the East African disease. Chief among your current concerns is resolving the question of the means of transmission and the spread of this so-called virus. Despite spending time at the epicenter of this disease, you have had no symptoms, or at least not of the type you observed there, could this mean that this mysterious virus has a different effect on different people? Perhaps a single virus can even give rise to a different disease. As you're wandering near the cathedral, thinking about the strands of the puzzle, you come across a small boy selling newspapers. Something catches your eye on the front page, and so you buy a copy. You have only learnt a few words and expressions in Dutch, so you can't really understand the article properly, but you do understand that it has an article about your and B-Man's research. Skimming the article, you see it mentions the university, the professor, and some of his colleagues. There's no trace of your name, however. It's certainly puzzling. Why would B-Man have kept your name out of the report? What motivation could he have had? It's very strange, because you would never have taken him for an opportunist. Then there's the question of Zanzibar. Since the moment you first arrived, the professor has continuously avoided the subject. Despite using ideals and evidence gleaned from your experiences, you haven't once discussed it openly. The colors of Delft soften as the shadows lengthen and evening falls. As you walk back to your lodgings, you reflect on what your next move will be. Entering the apartment, you immediately smell Reginald's cooking. You fall into an armchair and tell your friend that you aren't hungry. Your appetite has been ruined by this discovery. You're mulling over plausible explanations when there's a knock on the, at the door. Who is it? I'm looking for Dr. Huntington. You recognize the voice. It's Meyer. Reginald turns to look at you questioningly. But you're already on your feet, moving closer to the door. I mean... Fuck it, there's no reason to, like, question him through the door. I could just ask him questions. You open the door to find Meyer's smiling face. Immediately ask if you'd accompany him for a drink. Sure, fuck it, why not? Reginald watches you with a look of confusion as you get your things and leave with Meyer. You go together to the nearby pub, and he, uh, he buys you a drink, too, as he says to congratulate you. We are very satisfied with your work so far, Dr. Huntington. You have handled our investment, uh, your handling of our investment has proved extremely fruitful. Meyer cuts off your objection with a rapid hand movement. I imagine you are disturbed by the most recent developments, but then again, 
I'd always thought a man like you would be more interested in the results rather than the fame. Is that not so? You try to remain impassive as you become aware of how closely he's scrutinizing you. B-Man wasn't exactly happy either, but he understood why it was necessary to leave your name out of the press. As I hope you will, as I hope you will, the important thing is that you got great results. You have worked for us, and you have been duly compensated. Meyer's speaking in allusions again. Without saying anything explicitly, his message is perfectly clear. He wants you to leave Delft, without seeing or speaking to B-Man. Meyer leaves you with no uh, leaves, giving you no choice to reply. Uh, fumble, no chance to reply. He seem it seems your German backers have gave B-Man no choice but to leave you out of the publication of your results. Reginald agrees with you. You are left frustrated and angry. Ignore them, old boy! Yes, you will. You will ignore their warning and speak to B-Man first thing tomorrow morning. Parasite Agents. Opening your eyes, you're immediately filled with determination. Filled with determination. You're going to confront Dr. B-Man and find out exactly why he was compelled to do what he did. You have breakfast quickly and consider what you will need to take to assert your position. Take the briefcase and take your copies of the research. Hmm. Hmm. That's a tough call. I mean, I'm just going to use words. Like, I could go, aha, I too have my copies of the research, but, I mean, he could take them from me in that instant, or someone else could. You've worked closely with B-Man for many months, and you certainly have nothing to prove to him. You must only speak to him as one academic to another. You leave your briefcase where it is and go. As you are walking to B-Man's house, you go over and over in your mind the words you will use to explain your position. Although the general idea remains the same, you make some mental edits until you come with the best possible phrasing for what you want to say. Reaching his house, you pass by three young men laughing and joking around the street outside. They look like three friends returning from a night of revelry. Remembering times like those, you smile and feel a little envious. You straighten your coat in front of the door and knock. A butler calls for B-Man, but when he comes to the door, his face carries an expression of bewilderment. Good morning. Who are you? Do you mean to say you don't know me? B-Man appears earnest, even somewhat irate. I'm sorry, sir. I'm quite sure that I've never met you in my life. There must be some misunderstanding. Now, if you please, I'm a very busy man. The butler and another certain approach, and the doctor pushes you lightly towards the door as if shooing away some kind of annoying insect. Fuck this. You turn your body and wedge yourself there. Before the door can close, you must try and speak with B-Man. It cannot end like this. I mean, persuade, obviously. Oh, come on, really? I could have... Mm, that's annoying. That is very annoying. I could have... Put, I'm doing it now, but I could have put my speechcraft up before I did that. I should have. Wait, I can just do this now. Right? I can cheat the system like that. See if that works. Persuade. Nah, it's still a failure. I think I'm just destined to fail that regardless of what I say. Because, like, I had a four there. What if I do this? Yeah, again. I'm at a four in speechcraft. You all see that. Just want to make that perfectly clear. I should hit story. That's on me. I mean, I could try attack, but my attack is shit. No, no, I, I think I just fucked myself by hitting that before I buffed myself. Oh, well. Why don't you remember Zanzibar? The disease? Try to explain some of what has happened. But only disconnected words spill out. The doctor interrupts you brusquely. I do not enjoy being pounced upon by a madman in my own home. Please remove yourself or I shall have to call the police. As he's speaking, 
with help from his butler and another servant who pushes you towards the door and closes it behind you. You stare at the closed door. You realize that it would be pointless to insist and knock again. If B-Man has answers, you certainly won't get them through force. Confused, you head to your flat. B-Man appears sincere in his reaction. Did he be telling the truth? Have the previous months all been in your head? Instead of lessening your returning journey, or bumble, instead of lessening on your return journey, your doubts now rise to the surface and compete for your attention. You left your notes at the flat, and you need them now to see them, to touch them, to know that you have not completely lost your mind. You've been walking lost in thought for some time, and you suddenly catch movement out of the corner of your eye. Turning, you see the three men you had seen outside B Man's house. Is it possible they're following you? stop at a newspaper stand, pretending to be interested in the papers. To gauge their reaction, they also stop nearby once you start walking again, if they do too. This is no coincidence. Over the months you have spent working with B-Man, you have had ample opportunity to get to know your way around Delft. Now, you decide to use this knowledge to your advantage. You will try to lose them, or else lead them into a situation where you can confront them more easily. Face your pursuers, you know how to very well very well how to defend yourself even when outnumbered. One against three, you wouldn't stand a chance. You better run away as long as you can. I think I'm gonna go with that option because again, I have not specced for fighting. You are alone. There are three of them. You decide the confrontation is not your best option. Just ahead there's a narrow alleyway. You take it, pick up your pace, uh, pick up your pace to a run, then turn at the first road that crosses it. You continue taking random turns and accelerating, hoping to lose them, but to no avail. You can hear their footsteps behind you. Now they've started running. It has become a real chase. You change your strategy and start running away from the city center. You continue your strategy in, of trying to lose them in the city center. Yeah. You continue with the strange, same strategy, trying to lose them in the narrow, labyrinthine streets of the city center. And every time you turn around, you see where they are. They seem closer. Your breathing becomes late, is becoming labored. Perhaps this wasn't the best strategy after all. If you don't see something soon, they'll catch up. Well, we'll use my best stat here. Um, agility and observation are literally met with each other, but we're tired out at this point. Study the layout of the local area and find some sort of advantage. Or I could just scream. Without slowing down, you scan the area, looking for anything which could help you in your escape. In the middle distance, there's a cafe. And beside the rear entrance, there's a tall stack of crates. As you pass, you tug on one of the crates near the bottom of the stack, making them all collapse, uh, making them collapse in all directions and block the alleyway. You know it, wouldn't, uh, it won't stop them, but it should slow them down a bit little. Now that you've succeeded in gaining a little ground on the men chasing you, it's time to think of a strategy for getting away from them indefinitely. Back to seek refuge. Seek refuge in the cathedral, which is close. Hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, going to the cathedral, they might just walk on in. Uh, the police might be a good idea. I could try a surge. I could try to back into the alleyways to seek refuge. Hmm. This is a tough call, honestly. Well, we've got four choices. I don't think I'm going to cathedral. To a cathedral. Uh, hmm. I think I'm gonna try... I'm gonna try playing with my stats over playing with... Nope. Oh, I, I'm stuck picking that. Okay. You put all your efforts into a final desperate sprint, but after less than a minute, you're forced to slow down by a painful stitch in your side. Your sedentary life in Delft has taken its toll on your fitness. Behind you, you can hear that your pursuers have gained ground. The three men surround you. Professor Huntington, it's time to understand that your collaboration with Dr. B-Man is over. Please stop trying to see him and exposing yourself. Your work is too valuable. You should be more discreet. He has a thick German accent. 
When he finishes speaking, the man shakes you violently. Understood, Huntington. You're an intelligent man, Huntington. Don't do anything stupid. We keep an eye on you. The three men walk off, and you recompose yourself. As you begin to walk home, your fear immediately disappears, and the burning anger rises up inside you. You will not be intimidated by these brutes, and you start thinking of how you're going to be able to prove your findings. You rush to the flat as quickly as possible. You cannot wait to have a degree of safety. You go up the steps to the flat, but once again, you find the door has been forced. You listen carefully, but it seems to be silent inside. Going inside, you see Reginald lying on the floor and immediately rush over to him to check his vitals. He's unconscious and his face is bloody, but he doesn't seem to be seriously hurt. You realize that you had left your briefcase at home. You go over immediately to the place where you left it, but find it empty and curse loudly. <sighs> Without evidence of your work, how will you be able to face the scientific community? Fuck. The notes of your research with Berman Ber B-Man have been stolen. <sighs> well, I failed two achievos during this run, but that's fine. It's fine. I don't care. Only one way to convince B-Man to talk, involve him in the scandal. Local newspapers are always looking for stories like this. But I have no evidence. Try to convince the scientific community of your reason. You are confident that they will listen to a colleague in need. Either option is kind of shitty. And if I go to the newspaper, it's just gonna... Even if they do publish what I said without any evidence is going to be bullshit. They're going to fucking, like, go, ha! Huh. <laughs> Look at this guy sensationalizing everything. I guess I'll go to the scientific community. After weighing it up, you determine that the best thing to do is appeal directly to Delft's scientific and medical community. Thus, you return to the university and meet with the rec rector, Van Vermeer, who, has turn who in turn arranges a meeting with the same medical board for that same afternoon. You're feeling nervous and on edge about presenting your case in front of all these staid and suspicious professors. It takes you back to your student days, and although you do have the strength of your convictions, the accusing attitudes of these men make you feel strangely guilty. You begin recounting your side of the story regarding B-Man's research explaining your discoveries in Zanzibar and their role in the subsequent results of your collaboration. You close with an account of the bizarre encounter with B-Man after the publication of your work. Dr. Huntington, these allegations of yours are most serious. Dr. B-Man, who is not here today, denies not only your involvement, but even that he knows you. Why exactly would a microbiologist be working with a doctor on this kind of research? Do you have any evidence to support your version of the events? I had copies of the notes, but they were stolen. Oh, that's not going to play over well. Jake, this is going to go poorly for you. You should have looked for the fucking notes first! Of course, how convenient. Perhaps this th theft is all part of a plot against you, sir. Gentlemen, we have before us a braggart or a fool. Murmurs and barely stifled laughs rise among the assembled academics. You make a feeble protest, but it's clear that they are no longer listening. You abandon this futile attempt and walk off angrily, trying to ignore the derision... Der derisory? Durasori comments behind you, but it is not over yet. You have just resolved to break into the lab. You arrive at the laboratory. Nobody is currently using it, and the door is locked. You try without success to force it open. On closer inspection, it seems the door has been reinforced following a recent break-in. But you will not be deterred so easily. You have heavy bust from plinth in the corridor, try to break it down. You decide to try and steal the keys from reception. You try to force yourself through a connecting window. Keys. After all the time you spent working with Doc with B-Man, you know exactly where the extra copies of keys are. You find a place where you can observe the small office behind the reception to watch the comings and goings of the administrators. So you can pick the right moment to nip in and take the keys. Are you fucking kidding me? 
How is it that I'm failing so much all of a sudden? I guess three wasn't enough. Corner is empty, and you notice the janitor, junior administrator, has been called away on some errand. You look around quickly, seeing no one else, and quickly nip behind the desk to grab the rack of keys. Hey, what are you doing in there? Professor is seeing you. Suddenly, there is noise behind you. Someone notices your presence. Two large burly men, perhaps from the campus security, grab you and unceremoniously throw you out of the main entrance. The reactor is waiting for you. Rector, Rector is waiting for you there. Dr. Huntington, I must inform you that if you ever dare show your face here again, you won't e you won't get even a foot inside. You walk away unhesitatingly from the university. You know full well that your connection with this place is over forever. Now you must think of an alternate strategy. Oh, that, that was just that. Well, that sucks. That sucks a lot. <sighs> Whatever. I guess we're going here. You've made inquiries now, and you have an appointment with Grote Marked. The Market Square with a group of journalists. You've decided that the best solution is to put the whole situation into the public domain even at the risk of creating a scandal. There are only five journalists present, and they give you looks which betray their differing approaches. Two of them seem curious, the others very skeptical. You recount the facts of the case, and you can see that for many of them, the story, albeit true, seems unappealing. Do you have any evidence? I'm not going against those professors without something solid. They'd have us for breakfast. You stiffen up as you think back to the lawsuit briefcase. Just when you're about to answer, the reporter who asked you for evidence pushes back in his chair and stands up. Okay, I think we have our answer. Even if your story were true, I don't think we have much more to say. If you want some advice about professors, though, I've heard that there are some excellent mental health doctors in Paris. The other journalist laughs at their witty colleague. You don't even protest, as you see them walking away. You know this has only been a colossal waste of time. Something, however, keeps your eyes on them as they walk off. Particularly, something on the behavior of the journalist who so rudely challenged you. Yes! There's something odd about his attitude. At one point, he turns to look at you and smiles, making a gesture with his hands to indicate that you're crazy. His mouth is laughing, but his eyes are not. Rather, they're watching you carefully suddenly aware that there is something military-like about his bearing. He definitely doesn't carry himself like a journalist. As an ex-soldier yourself, you recognize when someone is pretending to be a civilian. It seems you cannot make any progress whatsoever, neither here nor from public opinion in general. It will be a while yet before the consequences of what you and B-Man have discovered become known to the public. You and you obviously can't wait around for something like that to happen. You're disappointed and angry. You have been mocked and ridiculed. How can you possibly put up with such a situation? With this thought in your mind, you leave the market square. Alone against the world. With that, I think we're going to end this episode here. In the next one, we'll see what Jack's going to do at this point. I mean, he's kind of up shit creek without a paddle. Really should have brought that fucking suitcase. I made one mistake after another. Damn. Well, see you guys then. 